Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight a highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and the hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. So, this is what you want me to tell them. The people, your people who have lived in dark exile all these many years with their, their backs up against some Babylonian wall. It was one thing when you had me tell the king that a, a virgin would give birth. Go back to sleep, my dear. I'm talking to God. Is he listening? <laughs> what do you mean, is he listening? Well, are you listening to him? You see what I mean, Lord? Even my own wife questions me. Now, you are God Almighty. You do what you want to do. But you want me to tell the people that Messiah is going to be just uh, some plain fellow like one of us? That he's going to suffer? He's going to die? Why not Moses uh, to lead us out of exile? Or, uh, or King David, uh, the mighty warrior, not some tiny li little... Ah, uh, where is the oil for the lamp? It's where it always is. Uh, ah, this is what I'm talking about, Lord. We are a people in darkness, stumbling around, stubbing our toe on the sin of the world. Uh, we need a mighty rescuer. Uh, we need, uh, we need a savior, not some tiny little. Ah. Such a tiny flame. And the whole room is filled with light. I am a man of unclean lips. Forgive me, Lord. 
I will tell them what you have shown me. Even if I don't understand it. I will trust you, good Lord, in your own good time to, to bring us uh, Emmanuel. To bring us light and hope. Yeah. Light and hope. I'm coming back to bed. That song, uh, sometimes when we hear a new version of an old song, it helps us to refocus on the words and to rethink what we're singing about. And that actually is one of the oldest songs we sing in church. Uh, that song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, has its roots uh, as a song as, as far back as the 700s. 
And, and if you know the original tune and melody we sing as a Christmas carol, it's almost like a Gregorian chant. It's from the Dark Ages. But as a poem, as, as a chant, as reciting, uh, there's, there's a really clear record of it from as early as the 500s. So one of the oldest songs that we sing, we're going to talk about that uh, as we go through this this morning. All of it comes from the book of Isaiah. And I hope you've noticed this morning, all of this is fitting together. And if you don't, I think the lights will come on as we go through, as we, as we lit the hope candle, uh, as we watch the video of Isaiah about light and hope. And that song really, if we look at the words, is really all about hope. We want to look at Isaiah today. Um, the time period that Isaiah lived, they were just approaching the exile. It was a dark day. People had strayed from God like crazy. Uh, the economy, the, the society and everything, it was just difficult and dark. Uh, and they were just about to head off with their cities destroyed to head off into exile. There was a time they needed hope. They needed a rescuer. And like uh, he said in the video, uh, Isaiah talks about this, this, this little light that lights a whole room. And this little child that would come, that would light the whole world in a dark and broken world. And I hope uh, that you'll join me at the start of the new year reading through the whole Bible together uh, chronologically. We will have very soon reading plans out and videos that will help you and other resources that we'll teach on those things on Sundays. But when we get to Isaiah next summer, there's actually about 15 uh, books in the Old Testament that all overlap. And because it's chronological, we won't read all of Isaiah, then all of Jeremiah, then, and, and, but we'll actually read the little bits of it simultaneously from all the different books as it goes chronologically. It gives us an awesome picture how all this fits together. But the truth in all of that, one of the things that we will see clearly is people longed for hope. People longed for a hope that they could hold on to. They were waiting to be rescued and released from their lives of trouble and hard times. And, and it's not the same today. The difficulty in life is different and the situations in life is different. But a lot of the problems are the same. Anybody know somebody that's longing to be rescued from their trouble? I think we all do. And anybody know somebody that wakes up and wonders if today could possibly be any worse than yesterday? I think we all do. But the truth is, that's just as bad as living in exile 2,500 years ago. We watch the news, uh, and, and I think you'd agree that our world, in a sense, is in exile from what it should be and what it ought to be. And whether we are living seven centuries before Jesus, like Isaiah, or 21 centuries after Jesus, people still need hope to hold on to. And, and the Christmas season should be a really good reboot for us in all of this, a refocus on hope. Well, there's where that song comes in. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Now, the, the original song, the song is in Old English, and it's one of the ones that, that if we don't really get Old English, it, 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 it's confusing. And we don't really even know what it's about. Maybe we sing it every Christmas, and we don't even really know what this song's about. I want to talk about that today, because um, here's where this song comes from. It comes from the book of Isaiah. And over the course of the book of Isaiah, there's lots of things he tells us about Jesus who would come 700 years later. Lots of description. And this song takes seven of those descriptions of Jesus. All of them are about hope. All of them are about Jesus. And all of them hundreds of years before he came. So let's look at these seven things. There's seven verses in that carol. And I want to look at those seven things uh, we'll, we won't take any, a long time on any of them. I want to look at all seven of those things uh, from the book of Isaiah and how it fits in the context of the song. So do you have a Bible with you? I want to start in Isaiah chapter 7. In Isaiah chapter 7, this is the first time that Isaiah himself 
talks about Jesus coming. And really, uh, the prophets all the way through the Old Testament, these prophets, a prophet literally is someone who uh, hears the word of God and then stands up in public and said, this is what God says. That's what a prophet is. And so as you saw in the video, doesn't mean that he gets it or understands it. And sometimes they even struggled. And this is one of the ones that he said he struggled with. In, in verse 14 of chapter 7, they had asked for a sign. And he says in verse 14, all right, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, a virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, I know I've asked, been asked this question lots of times. In the Old Testament, the word Emmanuel, the name Emmanuel starts with an I. In the New Testament, it starts with an E. Do you know the difference? It's really simple. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in Greek, and the Hebrew and Aramaic translates with an I, and the, the Greek in the New Testament translates with an E. There is no other difference. Um, but here... A virgin will conceive a child, will call his name Emmanuel. The name Emmanuel means God with us. And this is one of, one of the clearest descriptions, one of the clearest pictures in the book of Isaiah of who this is talking about. And, he, he, and, he, and he's literally saying, God, the God of heaven, will be with us on earth. Face to face, God in person right here. Now, do you think for these people in the dark, troubled world, ready for exile, and, and, and the hundreds of miles away from their home, their cities destroyed, God is going to come and live with us. Think that brought hope? Of course it did. The lyrics in that song, the first verse, said, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, Israel that mourns in lonely exile until the Son of God appears. That's hope. O come, O come, God be with us. That's hope. The second one is in chapter 9, just a, a page later. In chapter 9, verse 2, he writes, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Now, as if you remember in the video, he's fumbling around in the darkness and he's talking about as we live in this darkness, stumbling along in our sin, a little bit of light lights the whole world. What about spiritual darkness? The lyrics in this song said, Come thou day spring, come and cheer. Now day spring is interesting because I don't know what that is. It's in Old English, and it's an Old English translation, which literally, it should in today's world, is just... The, the brilliant sunshine of the beginning of dawn. The darkness and the gloom, the, the sun breaks through over the horizon, or a cloudy day and the sun breaks through. It's this brilliant light, the day spring. Come thou day spring. Come and cheer our spirits by your advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to, to flight. People in darkness, people living in gloom, the brightest of lights is coming. Come, brilliant light, disperse the gloomy clouds. Do you think in that context there's a little bit of hope there? All right, let's go to the next one. Isaiah chapter 9 still, down a few verses, starting at verse 6. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The words like government and rule and throne. He's describing the king of the nations. We put this together with other things that he says. He talks about, Isaiah also talks about all kings of the world will stand silent in his presence. He talks about how, how this king is the lawgiver from centuries ago. On Mount Sinai, when Moses received the Ten Commandments, that that came from this king. And he says, all people on earth will come to the mountain 
and be taught by God. It says that this king is the one who gave us the law. But he's saying, Isaiah is saying, that this Messiah that's coming will be the king of all nations. Listen to that, this verse from that hymn. O come, O come, thou Lord of might, who to thy tribes on Sinai's height in ancient days didst give the law in a cloud and majesty and awe. Come, come, O king of nations. Now for a, for a, for a, a country, a nation in exile, what brings more hope than the king who's the mighty leader, who will rescue them, the mighty king, a real king, a proper king, making all things right? We see more of uh, King David's thread that was mentioned there in the next one. Go over to chapter 11. Chapter 11, in verse 1, it talks about that directly. It says, out of the stump of David's family a shoot will grow. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. Now, that's an interesting word picture, right? The stump from David's family. Uh, in some translations, it says the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. What it literally is, is, is this word picture that, that David's kingdom was cut off. And every king after David got worse and worse and worse and further and further and further from God became a line of people that were not the descendants of David. So David's kingdom, God's established kingdom there, was cut off like a tree stump. And out of that dead tree stump, a new shoot is going to grow. Right? We've seen that. We've seen that happen in real life. We see that picture. From the cut off stump, a new sprout would grow. And if we went down to verse 10, it says, an heir to David's throne will be the salvation of of the whole world. The long line of King David, of God's established kingship on earth, will return in Jesus. I think that gave them hope. Here's the lyrics from that verse. O come, thou rod of Jesse. You see that word picture there? Free your people from Satan's tyranny. From the depths of hell thy people save and give them victory over the grave. Now, David, as king, was the last, historically, the last glimmer of hope that they had. It got worse and worse and worse since then, and every king after him took, took them further from God. Hearing that this was going to come back would immediately ignite hope for them. Are you with me? Are you getting this so far? Their long-awaited rescuer was their hope. The next one is in Isaiah chapter 22. In Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, he says this is another interesting one that's not immediately understandable. I will give him the key to the house of David, the highest position in the royal court. He will get the key to the house of David. What that means is uh, that's ultimate authority. If David was their king, their last glimmer of hope, the last good king who sought God, then the key to the house of David it actually meant ultimate royal power. In verse 22 there, he says, he will open doors that no one can close. It says in verse 24 that he will bring equity and honor to even the lowest of all people. So, so when he has the, the ultimate authority, ultimate royal power, a door he opens, nobody else closes. A door he closes, nobody else opens. And there will be equality and justice. Listen to the verse here that's from this song. O come, thou key of David, come. Open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high. And close the path to misery. See the hope? Give us a safe way forward. Lift us up out of our misery. Come and unlock the prison walls of darkness and the shadow of death and open the door to heaven. This king from David's line. Last couple, let me do really quick. Back to Isaiah 11. Uh, we read verse 1 before. Let me read verse 2 now. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. 
the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And, and over in another chapter, he says that, that his, his wisdom will be beyond anyone and his knowledge will be great and he will lead them in those things. So um, if, you, if you continue to read on chapter 11, the rest of that whole page is all about Jesus and there's lots more things there. But this wisdom that he has, this knowledge that he has, this understanding that he has is straight from God himself. He sets him apart. And so this is what we sing. O come, thou wisdom from on high, all order all things far and nigh, to us the path of knowledge show and cause us in her ways to go. Like I said, this is all such old English and, and, and it just we sing those songs and most of the time it just kind of goes like this. But it all makes sense. What's he saying? Come and show your people the way back. Let us walk in wisdom and understanding. Put things back in its proper order. And here's the last one in chapter 61. In chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He's talking here again about the Messiah that would come. And when Jesus was alive, Jesus quoted that and said that was about him. So either he's ridiculously arrogant and a liar and deceiving people, or this really is about him. And he's come to give new, good news to the poor. And, and, and this word here, all the way through this, the sovereign Lord has anointed me. And the sovereign Lord and the Lord's favor, um, that's what this last verse talks about. The absolute sovereign God who is in complete control. Let me take a look now at this whole list and put it together, all right? Let me show you that. God with us, in flesh, face to face on earth, a light for people who are in darkness. The king of all nations bringing unity and peace and justice. The authentic true king, the proper heir to the throne, with wisdom and understanding straight from God and royal, ultimate royal power, complete authority, the sovereign God who is in charge. Now rewind back to the darkest days in history for these people. Uh, and their city is destroyed. They are carted off into, to live in a foreign nation. It's, it's in exile. It's broken. If you read through the book of Isaiah, there is so much language about how dark this time is. And he uses fantastic word pictures. He says the buzzards are flying around in the sky and my home has become a haunt for jackals and the hyenas are mocking us. He says, I feel like a withered leaves on a tree. A pile of thorns have taken over our country. Uh, at one point, he even says, all I can see is a plumb line of emptiness. It was dark days. And yet you put this into it. And all he's talking about is hope. Hope is on the horizon. Hope will come. Now, rewind back to the 700s. We talked about before the 500s. This would have been chanted and sung in Latin. And there's some interesting things about that. Not that I know Latin or have anything, but, but if you look at the, the words in Latin here, go ahead and put that up there. The, the, the words in Latin, in the yellow there, uh, are, are what they would have chant, chanted. Now, we sing them in a different order than they would have done it back in those days. They put them into a different order because of a poetic... Um, it had a nice artsy poetic meaning. Does that make sense? See, artsy people were really like this. If you put them, the next slide has them all in the right order. Okay? So that's in their order. And if you take the first letter of each of the Latin words, you have arrow, arrow 
arrow crass. And here's what that means. Tomorrow I will come. Isn't that cool? So not only does all of these things point to Jesus, and, and Isaiah's book is full of other pictures of Jesus, but, but the, when they took this and they put it into the song and into poetry, they did it in a way that also said, he's coming, he's coming. Regardless of their order, how they chanted it or how they sung it or whether it was a new version or an old version, this song has been part of our Christian Christmas tradition since the early church. In exile, 2,500 years ago, or in a broken world today, we have the same hope, knowing that tomorrow he's coming. That he is coming. Isaiah's theme almost through his whole book is there's hope on the horizon. Hope comes to life in Jesus. One more thing about hope. Are you okay? Yeah, we're okay. One more thing. Isaiah. Isaiah's name means the salvation of God. His whole book is about this coming salvation. And he points to that over and over again. And, and this, this great rescue of God. And folks, that is the hope of Christmas. And that hope arrived 700 years after Isaiah died and his name was Jesus. Now the name of Jesus means God saves. So, so Isaiah, the, the great rescue of God, points to Jesus, God saves. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a land of deep darkness, for them a light will shine. For unto us a child is born, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Folks, this is hope. This is the first week of Advent, and that's why we look at hope there. But let me ask you this. Do you know that hope? That hope's name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, whether we were living 2,500 years ago or we were living 700 years ago or we're living today, hope is what our world needs. And yet, we live after all of this and we can look back and we can see it all unfold and we still gain hope from that as a matter of fact god we live our lives on that hope banking and resting on that hope so we thank you for your word thank you for how relevant your word is that you are god with us jesus you are the bringer of, of hope and peace and joy and love. We celebrate that, especially this month. And God, as we celebrate Christmas, as we await your presence, bring us hope. Bring us hope. In Jesus' name.